Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and board game aficionado. Welcome to Rogue Watson Reviews, my video review series where I take a look at tabletop games. Now these videos are divided into three parts. First, I'll introduce the game, take a look at the components, and briefly explain how it plays. Second, I'll run through a sample turn or round of the game. And finally, I'll list my pros and cons and provide my final thoughts. If you enjoy my videos, consider supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shoutouts to my platinum patrons, Andrew, Brian, Richard, and Joe. And gold patrons, RPG Papercrafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy and Yuma, Marcos David Vicente Gilberto, Sean aka Cert 2B, Adam, Dead Lizard Lounge, and Alkshi. Thank you all very much for your support. With this video, we're going to be taking a look at Clank in Space! And the Clank in Space Apocalypse Expansion. Clank in Space is a competitive deck-building dungeon crawler developed and published by Direwolf Digital and Renegade Game Studios in 2017 as a sci-fi follow-up to 2016's original fantasy-themed Clank, a deck-building adventure. Clank in Space Apocalypse was the first expansion released in 2018 and adds new cards, new dungeon tiles, and a new scheme mechanic, but we'll get to that later. In Clank in Space, players take on the role of rebellious thieves and scoundrels, sneaking aboard the mothership of Lord Eraticus in order to steal some artifacts and escape. Everyone will start with the same 10 card deck and take turns purchasing new cards, defeating enemies, discovering secrets, and making their way through the dungeon, uh, I mean spaceship. Whoever makes it out of the ship with the most accrued points is the winner, though it's also possible to win by being the last one standing, or for the game to actually end in defeat for everyone, which is often just as fun. Before we begin, I must confess I've never played the original Clank. I was sent Clank in space as a review copy along with the Apocalypse expansion, so this review is coming from the perspective of someone who is entirely new to the Clank series. Alright, let's take a look inside the box. Now, Clank in Space includes a modular spaceship map that's built during the setup. And the base game includes three double-sided pieces for a total of six different layouts. Each of which can be put in one of three different places on the map. Let's take a look at these modules. Now, uh, preface this, I already have the Apocalypse expansion mixed into the base game. So if you see more pieces and more cards in my game, that's the reason why I have not uh, separated them. Nor do I even really remember. I believe these three are the ones that come in the base game, and you can see they are double-sided. And they fit like puzzle pieces, very, very snugly with the outer end. And these are probably the two that come in the uh, Apocalypse expansion, I think. Mainframe, Viral Lab, trying to remember, but uh, they do offer different uh, interactions, which is very cool. Now, the cargo bay is always the same. This is the starting area that you start on. It also serves as your health bar, which is really nice. So you just have one big community bar for everybody. And you literally build this thing like a little puzzle, and I'll show more of this during the sample term. You can see this is the area that holds the clank, and then try and fit this all on the camera. You can see there's the beginning. And the idea here is then you slot the modules in like so. And you do three of these, boom, I guess it'd be like boom, boom, and then boom. And then the final area is also always the same, which is the, uh, I don't know what this area is called, Lord Eraticus's main uh, parlor, I suppose. This is where all the artifact symbols go, as well as the rage meter that keeps track of how often we are pulling cubes for Lord Eraticus. Now the dungeon tiles all look very nice with very clear information and iconography. You can instantly see where all the tiles connect. Let's grab a, well I guess we can use this as a sample tile. So you can see it takes one movement to go to any of these connecting spaces. These are all essentially rooms in the spaceship. If there's two boots, that means it takes double the movement to get there. If there's a little enemy symbol, it means it takes some kind of uh, attack power, sword symbols on your cards in order to get there, or you can take damage. If there's a little locked door symbol, it means you need a key to get through there. So again, very, very easy to tell what's going on. If you go into this room, you can heal. If you go into these security checkpoints, you have to stop your movement. Very, very clear on what's going on. It's a really, really fun map when it's all built together, and I'll show more about that in the sample turn, but I really do love this map quite a bit. Now your ultimate objective in the game is to grab one of these artifacts at the right side of the ship and then hightail it back to the left side. So you essentially have to go through the entire board once and then again as you leave. To gain access to this right side, however, you need to hack two different data nodes using cubes. You can see those little 
these are supposed to be kind of barrier entryways to get to this right side of the map. So in order to do that, you'll have to place your cubes in one of these green areas. So this motivates you to have to go to these other sections and place your data cubes here, and they'll give you whatever reward here, although the star is actually bad. That's a clank symbol. You don't want to do that one if you can help it. Um, but everybody can only take uh, one cube. Once you've done two, you gain access to the right side, uh, and that's how you then get the artifact, and then you need to flee and go back the way you came. But as you make your way through the ship, uh, you're going to be incurring the wrath of Lord Eraticus, and we're going to, in order to see how that works, uh, we need to take a look at the cards. First, I have all the schemes which have spilled over. Again, I've got the uh, expansion content just kind of mixed in here. We'll take a look at that in a moment. So here's what we get. We have a bunch of chits. These are uh, credits as well as secrets, which is placed on certain parts of the game board. Major secrets uh, go on the big question mark. Minor secrets go in the uh, double question mark. And these are just really nice um, bonuses, kind of like loot drops that you can pick up that all give different benefits, and they're all listed on the back side of the rule book. So, for example, it could be a health, it could be boots, it could be attack power, it could be a credit chip, any kind of extra thing that you get. Just a nice thing to grab while you're running around. The cards. That one is a wayward card. So you can see here is the main deck of cards. Here is the starting deck of cards. Clank in Space is a deck builder, which means you start with the same basic 10 card deck as everyone does. And then you're going to gradually build your deck over the course of the game. And each turn you're going to play five cards. This is uh, all four players' starting cards uh, put together. I believe this is a uh, 10 card deck right now. And again, if you have played one of the legendary games or a Star Realms or a Hero Realms, you pretty much already know how to play this game. It works exceedingly similar to that. There's only a few resources on each card that instantly generate when you play them. This is skill, which is equivalent to basically gold or any other currency. You need this to purchase other cards. So you can see, for example, take some purchasable cards that you can grab. Uh, they all cost a certain amount of skill in the lower right corner there. That's how much a card costs. So that is basically your currency. Uh, boots is obviously a unique symbol to uh, Clank and Clank in Space because you, that's how you move around the board. For every boot that you have, you can move one space. Um, I don't think the starting cards come with any attack power. You need to purchase those. But you can see there's the sword symbol. You'll need these to defeat certain cards that don't have uh, purchase power. Instead, they have swords. So when they come up on the marketplace, instead of being able to purchase them, you have to defeat them with swords, and then they give you some kind of benefit, as well as those areas on the map that have the enemy symbols. You'll need the swords to uh, make it through there without taking damage. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, boots, skill, swords. There's some of them obviously have special effects. So for example, uh, as we focus, focus, focus. Come on. There we go. Um, certain ones, you know, draw a card, uh, draw a card, trash a program. When you buy it, it gives you health, those kind of things. Now, we do have to worry about Clank. Clank is bad. You don't want to make Clank. You can say this is literally you stumbling and making noise and drawing the attention of Lord Eraticus. When you make Clank, that's when you have to add your cubes into that bag, and then whenever Lord Eraticus attacks, uh, which he does whenever one of these symbols comes up on a card in the marketplace, uh, the players have to then draw cubes equal to that rage track, and if your cube pops up in there, you take damage. It's a really, really smart, uh, clever symbol. Uh, clank is very bad. You want to get rid of Clank, but you start with cards that give you Clank, and sometimes you might get a good card that also produces Clank, so it's a really interesting uh, risk-reward system that works very, very well. Uh, if you haven't made it back to the cargo bay by the time that... Uh, you have died, then you are eliminated, uh, and then you have to, on your turn, draw cubes as if Lord Eraticus was attacking every time, which makes a cascading domino effect to everybody else, which is part of that late game, uh, really, really fun stuff that occurs. You can see the cube. Take a second of that. This is the bag, which is a very, very nice felt bag. Mine is covered in hair because I have lots of animals. And it just comes with a bunch of black cubes, which represent misses. Uh, so it needs to have those other cubes from other players. And it starts out with about 25 black cubes in here, meaning there's a lot of misses in the beginning, which also helps the pacing uh, quite a bit. 
But then as players produce clank and they put their cubes in the bag, they have an increased chance of drawing it because once you pull these black cubes out, uh, they are not returned to the bag. So the ratio gets worse and worse for the players. Now, before we go to the sample turn portion of this review, we need to go over what the Apocalypse uh, expansion adds. The Apocalypse expansion adds 35 new adventure cards. So you already have, uh, I think, nearly 100 of these in the base game, and the Apocalypse expansion adds 35 new cards, as well as those two new double-sided modules, which adds a huge amount of replayability. Now, the big new mechanic in the Apocalypse expansion are the schemes. You can see I've buried them under other things. Where are my schemes at? Schemes are very familiar if you have played, um, again, like a Marvel Legendary especially. These are very much uh, those kind of schemes where it's the villain trying to accomplish something and the players have to make it hopefully not happen until at least the late game. A scheme can be picked randomly or chosen. I believe it comes with eight in uh, three different difficulties, category one, two, and three, denoted by how nasty this scheme uh, is. Now what happens, and it's really, really clever, is that whenever you pull a black cube from the bag, instead of getting rid of it, you actually start filling up these schemes, which means the black cube suddenly means something, whereas in the base game, they really just represent those misses and then they go away. But here, black cubes start filling up these schemes, and once each one gets full, then this occurs. So for each section it occurs, and then by the final one it's always a ongoing effect that's a really debilitating global uh, thing that sucks. So this one is your first movement, each turn generates no movement. So just minus one movement to everybody. Now the players still have a chance uh, to deal with this. Every single scheme has a way that you can take black cubes off of here. You can only take them from ones that they haven't yet filled up. So for example, if these four are full and there's one here, you can only buy the one here. You can't buy any of the ones here because this has already occurred. So it's already uh, gone through those stages. But in this example, you can spend two credits to take a black cube. If you already played a pirate card this turn, you can spend one instead. And they all have different uh, schemes, different things that happen. They're uh, fairly thematic. Some of them are interesting. Uh, some of them are very, very deadly, or at least feel deadly. Uh, I will say... While the schemes do a great job making the black cubes meaningful, and as well as the new modules also uh, tend to use the black cubes to where you can uh, purchase them and use them on certain cards. They'll have it like black cube equals health or something. They rarely seem to impact any of the games I've played. It's been very disappointing. Usually by the time we reach the final stage, we're in the very, uh, the final stage of the scheme. We're in the very, very final stages of our game of Clank in Space. Maybe we're just good about keeping up with the schemes, I don't know, but out of the half dozen or so games I've played with the Apocalypse expansion, the schemes have just disappointingly never really amounted to as much as we think they would just based on what's written here. Um, it's a neat idea, but ultimately maybe not quite as thrilling or exciting as uh, we were expecting. All right, uh, let's take a look at how the game plays with a sample turn. All right, so we're going to run through a sample round of Clank in Space, uh, including the Apocalypse expansion. Now, there's a lot of setup stuff that I'm not going to go over that's not really part of the scope of this review, uh, but this is what the completed board looks like. I say it takes up quite a bit of play, uh, space. There's the life bar in the top, the clank bar here, and the bottom. Uh, this is the marketplace that I've attempted to fit on the screen. You can't quite see the... Uh, as part of any deck builder, there's always those uh, couple cards that are in every single game uh, so that you have an option to buy cheaper cards that are useful even if the marketplace isn't quite giving you uh, what you need. There's the Rage track on the right side. Uh, I believe one of these is an Apocalypse uh, expansion module. And then the scheme at the top uh, that we are playing with is the Toxigenic uh, Plague. And we picked this one. Uh, specifically because we have the Viral Lab as one of our modules, so uh, we'll be able to use that. But uh, if you notice, we've actually pulled some uh, Clank uh, out uh, in the bag, and it has actually wounded us instead of pulling Black Cubes out. So funny enough, we haven't had any uh, progress made on the scheme. We are about uh, maybe two or three rounds into the game. I didn't want to do the very beginning because, again, everybody starts in the same spot and everybody has the same card, so it's just not super compelling in the very beginning. You're just basically buying your basic cards and you're kind of starting out. So every game basically starts very, very similarly. After that, however, players can spread out and go wherever they want, including taking this little super highway down uh, the middle as the orange player has done. You can't, uh, once you move on to it, you can't move off of it in the same turn, but it does allow you to skip ahead everywhere except this final area. You cannot get to this final area until you've placed your node. So again, your first 
goal is to reach uh, these little green spaces and put your cube down in there. And then once you've got two of those done, then you can make it to the right side, grab the artifact, and get back. So this is a three-player game. We've got uh, blue first, then orange, and then purple. So it is blue's play uh, turn currently. One, two, three, four, five. Let's see. Uh, what cards they end up with? Pretty much all starter cards, it looks like. Four hacks and a stumble. So unfortunately, we have to add a clank uh, to the clank space. If I had a minus clank, I could take that out before it goes into the bag, but I don't right now. I just have four skill that allows me to buy, uh, purchase a card that costs up to four. And it looks like I could get the Android Assistant, which lets me draw a card. Uh, you can teleport if you have another green faction card. Um, I did get a secret at one point that allows me to uh, use a uh, faction for one-time use. But it doesn't give you any victory points or anything else, so uh, limited uh, use there. The Battle School Genius, hello Ender, uh, costs three, gives two victory points at the end, and is worth another three skill. It's a very efficient card, but it adds one clank every turn, and that's a really dangerous one to get early in the game. So I think with our four, we are going to purchase a... Uh, you know what? We'll get two phasers. I don't think blue has any uh, sword power, so we'll get two of these phasers. These are a nice one to get so you can acquire that sword power early. So that's what they're doing. I didn't get any movement, so uh, blue player doesn't get to move at all from their position. Then we go to orange. Notice I didn't buy anything from the top, so I don't replenish the marketplace, which means there's no chance for Eradicus to attack, which is an important strategy to keep in mind uh, late in the game when nobody wants Eradicus to attack. Or if somebody does and you want another player to die, then you can just purchase up a whole bunch of cards and increase your chance of that happening. So this is orange player's cards. You've got Dr. Whiskers! Uh, now this is awesome because Dr. Whiskers' ability is to subtract two clank from orange. Notice how orange does not have any clank here. However, I'm about to make two clank because I just drew both of my stumbles, which are part of your starting uh, deck. So I would have to add two clank. However, I then play Dr. Whiskers, which takes away that two clank, which is awesome. Uh, otherwise, Dr. Whiskers just gives me one skill. So I also... Uh, as orange player, do not move. I don't have a crystal, otherwise I would be able to either heal or force the boss to attack. Crystals are acquired from uh, certain board spaces there. So instead I have three, and I'm probably... Now I could get the plus one clank. It'd be a little less risky because I've got a minus two clank. Um, and I think orange has the although most amount of damage, but least amount of clank in there. So let's be a little fun and go ahead and grab that battle school genius for three, and let's see, that was orange. Yeah, I do have a movement secret I could use to move, but it doesn't really do me a whole lot of good. Actually, I will go ahead and use that now, uh, just to move here, because I would have to move end my turn there at security checkpoint anyway, so that lets me get a little bit ahead and go towards that direction. So at the end of my turn, I have to replace the marketplace, and this is the imprisoned soldier, hello Riddick. Uh, if somebody buys it, they get plus two clank. It only draws a card. The reason it's so uh, expensive and with a nasty effect is it is worth five victory points at the end of the game. However, this symbol means that right now, Lord Eradicus attacks, which means we take our bag full of cubes. We take all the cubes currently in here, and there are a number of other players' cubes in here. I played a couple rounds. We shuffle them up. We check what our rage tracker is at, which is currently only at two, uh, starting a three-player game. So I only pull two cubes out of here, and I pulled a purple and a black. So purple is going to get wounded by one more. Whoops. And then a black cube, if we were playing the base game, would just get removed from the bag. However, because we are playing the Apocalypse expansion, that gets put on this scheme. So now this is going towards uh, this first plan, which is controlled testing. We trash all prisoners in the adventure row, and there are a couple, actually I guess it's just the imprisoned soldiers, the only prisoner, Princess Helia is not. So that was Blue's turn, now we go to Purple's turn, one, two, three, four, five, draw our cards, and this, finally, we get some movement. Um, we've got uh, four movement here, which is nuts. Uh, we're not going to trash any cards this turn, unfortunately, so we have no special abilities, but we still have two, three, four, five skill to purchase a card, and four movement to haul butt somewhere. Uh, so purple can move four uh, spaces, as well as purchase up to uh, 
two, three, four, five cost skill. So four spaces we could go. Now, unfortunately, this is a security checkpoint. Whoops. So we'd have to stop there. So it'd be a little waste of movement. This one, we'd take a damage because we didn't get a sword. Uh, but we could go one, two, use those two boosts to go three, four, and grab one of these secrets. The other option is we still need to be able to put our cube down. We don't want to put it here because that gives us double clank, which is bad. Those spaces are there if these cube areas start filling up. This one, however, gives us five credits and gives us a secret. So I think that's the best case. So we go one, double boots, cause two, three. We pick up the secret. It is a, there you go, it's a two swords. And a lot of these secrets are basically what cards do, but these don't take up room in your deck, so they're really good to have. We're also going to put our cube down, and I think that ends our turn. I actually have to check the rule book for that. But I think placing your cube ends your turn, even though we have one more movement. But we put our cube down, and this is a different kind of cube. It's a little more uh, translucent. If I show you the uh, difference here, uh, you can see that there is a... Whoa, we didn't focus that very well, did we? All right, well, I'm not going to focus. A uh, cube and a translucent cube, so there are differences there. And you immediately get that benefit. So purple gets five credits, and so far is the highest on towards getting towards their uh, hack done. All right, uh, we also have five. We can purchase up to a five. Um, I don't think anybody's getting that poor power converter. I like the imprisoned soldier, even though you add the two clank. But I think we're going to get it. We have to add two clank right now, which is a bummer. Um, but it's worth a lot of points at the end. Oh, dang it. Lord Eraticus attacks again with the Savage Gorkler. So, Purple is not happy about that, because then these two get put in there. We shuffle it up. We're still drawing two cubes. And we got a blue and a black. So, blue takes one damage. Everybody's taking two damage. And then there's the scheme filling up. Now, any time somebody can spend three skill, or three currency, what am I going to call it? to purchase one of those black cubes, and those black cubes can be spent at any place where it says a black cube can be spent, so right there you could uh, convert a black cube into health, uh, or there are certain cards that use black cubes, as well as just preventing the scheme from filling up in general. The special ability here is that if you're in the viral lab, which purple currently is, it only costs you two skill rather than three. Let's go ahead and play one more quick round because it does play pretty quick. Uh, it is a deck builder, so you're constantly having to shuffle your cards, especially in the beginning whole lot of shuffling, which is what I'm doing now. You can see this is the marketplace down here where you can purchase uh, the ability to use the teleporters, the ability to go through the locked doors, uh, just a one-time two health increase, and then this is basically just worth 10 points, although there are some cards that can use the uh, black market goods. You do have to be in a marketplace space to use it, and it costs seven credits, although credits are also worth victory points uh, at the end of the game. So it's technically not efficient to do that, but those are very, the, the keypad and the teleporter especially are very good ways to get around the board. All right, blue, one, two, three, four, five. We're back to you, blue, and you are, you were needing some movement. Oh my gosh, you didn't get much movement either. You got a clank instead, so you are going to uh, stumble and put your blue right there. Uh, you've got one movement, you've got two swords, and four skill. So your one movement, you could jump on the highway and move. That would be more efficient. Um, with two swords, we could defeat the kill bot for three. Let's do that first. So we're going to spend our phaser for two swords to defeat this kill bot. Oh my gosh, can I pick up the cards? There we go. And that just instantly gives us uh, three credits. We do not add that to our deck. That just gets taken out of the... Uh, marketplace and that adds three credits and again credits are worth victory points but also to purchase these items which are very very useful uh, we still have three skill we could buy something we're probably going to buy a boldly go because we need more movement uh, and that's just more of an efficient card and then we have one uh, pair of boots that we can do uh, let's go ahead and we don't have enough marketplace power um, but we will go ahead and move in here so unfortunately we can't do it and we definitely don't want to get too clank there so that's all blue is going to do on their turn. Let's go to uh, orange. Only has two cards, so I have to very quickly shuffle. Always shuffling with the deck builders, unfortunately. Oh, guess what? I forgot to replace the marketplace. But that is not going to be a Lord Eraticus attack. Blue. Or we're on orange. Orange, what do you got? All right, orange has two movements, 
It does have to generate clank right there, so we put that in our spot. We've got two, three, four, five, six skill with which to purchase another card and two boots uh, for orange. Orange, you would not get a sword though, and you're going to probably take some damage unless we can get you into... Let's see, orange has some money. We've got uh, two, three, four, five, six skill, and you can do these in any order that you want. Uh, we really want Princess Celia, but she's worth seven, that's unfortunate. The Psychic Master, draw two cards. Uh, is very, very nice. Uh, points if you get the reference. I believe this is from Dune. Uh, with the, like, fear box. Yeah, there we go. She's mastered her fear, have you? That one costs five, so we could get that one and a phaser. I'm kind of liking that. So we're going to go ahead and purchase that with our... Or, I'm sorry, we have six, don't we? So we're just going to purchase her for five. And then we still have two movement for orange... Um, we could go here to grab a secret. We can't go into the locked door, however. We still need to put our hacked nodes down, so we're going to go here for one, and we're just going to stop our movement and then hack that node. There's a health. We're going to spend that health to heal ourselves right now. Heal you, orange. And then you can put down your cube, and then orange gets four credits. Now Orange has enough to go to the marketplace, although there's not one nearby. Sorry, Orange. All right, last up, Purple is looking pretty good. I also have to shuffle Purple's cards because they only have two cards. I need to replace the marketplace. That is not a Lord Eradicus attack. No attacks for a while. Three, four, five... Purple is a really boring, awful hand. Pretty much starter deck. You get one clank you get to add to the board, and you have four skill. Um, not very exciting stuff you can do with that purple. It was a terrible, terrible pull. Um, let's see, for four I could get the registry hack, which only works if you really have a crystal. Again, that Android Assistant isn't terribly exciting. I do have the two swords uh, from the secret that Purple has. It uh, doesn't quite help me here. And I can't even move, which also uh, sucks quite a bit. So we're just going to need some more movement. So we're going to get a Boldly Go. And that's all we're going to do. So right now, uh, everybody's in their own module. Once they place that uh, node in one of them, so for example, Purple up there and Orange down there, have placed their node. They cannot put a node in another module. They would have to go to one of the other ones to get their second one out. Then that opens the door to the final area. They have to grab the artifact. They have to go out. However, once, as soon as one player puts both of their uh, nodes down and unlocks the final area, this rage tracker goes up. Also, once somebody grabs an artifact, this rage tracker goes up. Also, there's a couple secrets that make this rage tracker go up. And as they get higher, more cubes are being pulled. These red cubes represent a damage to everybody. The black cubes are going to get spent more and more. It's a really nice cascading uh, dungeon of terror for everyone involved. All right, let's go over my pros, cons, and final thoughts for Clank in Space and Apocalypse. Pro. The sci-fi theme is humorously applied and very tongue-in-cheek. Every single card is a reference to some famous sci-fi character like Han Solo or the Predator or whatever Chris Tucker's character name was from The Fifth Element. It's funny without being stupid funny, and I think it's the perfect sweet spot to hit. Pro, the modular game board lets you mix and match the spaceship design, adding a nice amount of replayability, which is an improvement over, Clank, over the original Clank's static map. Pro, the pacing and balance level is near perfect. The way the rage meter increases, the amount of cubes that get put into the bag and drawn out, everything just works in perfect harmony to create a steady curve as things start out easy and doable to at the end you're low on health and you're all scrambling toward the exit as players are falling left and right. No matter how it ends, it always ends on a high note. Con, the rule book is kind of a mess. It just assumes this isn't your first deck builder and most likely it isn't. But I found it annoying trying to find the information I needed when looking something up. Just not as well organized as I've been used to with other rule books. Con, this is specific to the Apocalypse expansion only, but the schemes seem cool on paper but rarely made much of a difference in our gameplay. It was nice to be able to use the black cubes as a resource, but ultimately the schemes felt more exciting going into it than they did by the end of the game. Con, 
The deck building is very familiar, especially if you've played any of the legendary games such as Marvel Legendary. Uh, it's going to feel like you're retreading the exact same kind of gameplay, like the Star Realms or Hero Realms. You're purchasing cards and you're buying more cards, you're playing all your cards every turn, there's even the faction symbols that you're energizing. None of that necessarily bad, but it does feel like a been there, done that uh, gameplay when you're playing Clank if you've played a lot of these other deck building games. All right, my final thoughts for Clank in Space. The deck building part is very, very familiar by the books. Again, if you've played a lot of these games like Star Realms or Legendary, you, you've done this deck building gameplay before. But the dungeon crawling aspect is a really neat addition without making it overly complicated or too RPG-like. I don't need this to be a Mage Knight or a Gloomhaven. It still stays uh, very, very easy to teach and easy to play. The best part of Clank in Space is the fantastic pacing. In every game I've played, things start out calm and easy, and by the time we've reached the end, we're tense, we're screaming, we're crying, we're yelling out, players are falling left and right, we're scrambling toward the exit. It's amazing how well balanced this game feels, no matter which strategy anybody is pursuing. Even times when we all fail miserably and die early, it still feels like a lot of fun. Highly recommended, although the Apocalypse expansion less of a recommendation. More cards and map pieces are nice, adds more replayability, just more content, but the schemes, which is really the signature part of the expansion, really fail to add another interesting layer, although base game is exciting enough as it is. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can enjoy more videos, reviews, and live plays of board games, video games, and tabletop RPGs here on my YouTube channel, as well as my website at roguewatson.com. And you can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. Thank you.